Right, good morning everybody and uh, welcome to this week's marketing crew meeting where we're going to be talking about all things sales, sales proposals, etc. And last week Nathan raised a very good point and I'm glad he did and, and I'd like everybody else that if they've got any overriding issues that they're facing, even only temporary issues, uh, con concerned with their business, their marketing, etc., then they just should raise it and um, I ought to just take just questions as they come. Uh, to get conversations going, because that's how conversations get going. Anyway, Nathan raised the the uh, eternal issue of, uh, it was about proposals. Do you want to go through it again, Nathan? And you may be thinking about a particular, Is it was it one isolated case where you've been asked to submit a proposal, or do you normally have to submit proposals? No, um, it's a funny one. So for some jobs that I do, sort of with new clients, I will submit kind of a glossy-ish proposal. Um, just to sort of show outline of what we've been asked to quote on, then our approach to it, and then, you know, how we go about the work and the cost. Um, I've got four or five in play at the moment. Some of them I've heard back about, which is good, but there's always two or three at any one time that you just, you kind of never, ever hear back from. It's really odd. And I found in the last couple of years, I've got much better at getting people to the proposal stage from the initial, you know, the initial contact or, or, or whatever it is. But then just trying to get uh, get a sort of get feedback on the proposals, really. Um, and a lot of people just never get back to you. And it's really, it's really <laughs> odd um, because you obviously spend the time to prepare it. So I just I was wanting to see if there was something that I was missing. I know it's something that the other people struggle with as well, just getting that follow up confirmation of sort of yes or no, really. Okay. So I guess ultimately, I guess ultimately, that's what we want. We want a yes or a no, don't we? Because we're all growing up, so we can handle a no. But it's just like, tell me something, you know. You you, you don't want to. I'll think about it. Really. Uh, Not really. No. <laughs> so, well, does everybody is everybody else in a proposal situation? Uh, uh, Chris and then Martin. Yeah. Obviously, I'm still waiting to hear back from uh, from Formula E and. That seems to have gone completely dark. Um, I, to be fair, I don't know if they'll just sit on that for for six months or nine months, uh, and then maybe come back to me. Maybe it's too early. Maybe COVID is too rife in Europe and America to contemplate it at the moment. But not hearing anything just pisses you off, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, <coughs> I suppose you can control that and just say, right, just park it and. Uh, and have yeah. some sort of follow-up system. But uh, Martin and then then Rod. Um, yeah, so I've sent a proposal out once and I did quite a lot of work around um, talking about a website that they needed and then you just hear absolutely nothing. So it's either, like Nathan said, you, you, know, you don't mind if they say, oh, actually, I don't want to go with this, but it's good to hear something. You know, just sort of common decency, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know what it's like. It can be irritating. Uh, we used to have that at uh, BNI at the end of a meeting of a visitor came. We, we actually committed just needed to know whether that person was going to take that particular slot because it was an exclusive slot. And if they weren't, they needed to know whether to carry on inviting. They just want to know where they are. You can't, you can't strong arm somebody into becoming a member of B&I and I and getting up at uh, very early times. Uh, Rod, you had a point and then yeah. Nick. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the same for me with funeral clients. You know, people come and talk to me on the market. I drop them a note in the post um, with some information. I follow up with a telephone call and, um, and it's just getting them to the point of where, whether they're ready to do it or not. And so consequently, when you ring them the first time, um, and in my letter that I would have written to them, I say that I'm going to ring them within the, the next seven to 10 days. Uh, when I do ring them, you can sense if they're ready or not. And I find, and you know this, Paul, I've told, told Paul many a time that it's never a no, it's just a no, not now. So what you do is you cleverly push it into the distance. Look, clearly it's too soon and you should be talking to your family about this, blah, blah, blah. This is what I would say, you know. Um, why don't I ring you in three months or is that too soon? And and just pitch it into the future so that it's not kicked away forever. 
and then just it's not worrying them it's you're you're being a professional following up your proposal and you need a conclusion and most of the time it's not no never it's no not now that i'm going to come back to that i think you're absolutely right there um is it a case of if you've got no i'm gonna i don't want to jump ahead uh who else had a point good morning rob uh, it was nick yeah I think it's a bit like um, the point Ros just made. I think sometimes either the business just isn't ready to make the decision or the person you're talking to isn't the final decision maker in the process. And there might be somebody else they've got to go to to get the final decision. But quite often we don't know what that process is or they haven't shared that with us. So we're, I think as everyone's saying, you kind of feel like you're left in the vacuum because you don't know what's going on. So I think yeah. or, it's yeah. sometimes it, it's trying to be patient, isn't it? But sometimes we just... Edge, you know, we just want to get that answer back, and then, <laughs> and then you can become kind of over, over keen, and then and then you can there's a risk you can kind of push them away because you're too keen and you're trying to push for an answer. So it's a it's a really fine line, I think, sometimes as to know how to how to push and when not to push and how to keep in touch and just to get. Imagine the it's across. dating and you you know you're going yeah. for the first kiss. You've got to be very careful. <laughs> well. <laughs> You've left me lost for words for a minute then, uh, Rod. Um, I, Rick, Nick, you just you just mentioned a couple of things. Everybody that knows me for any length of time, you know, I listen intently and I, I pick up uh, on words. And you said a couple of times, knowing when to push. And uh, I think that is, I'm not sure about that. I know what you mean. Uh, Maybe that's the wrong choice of word, but it's, it's knowing when to engage and when to connect. Um, and you also said something else that you don't know whether anybody else is involved in the decision. Uh, isn't that something you should ask? Shouldn't it is? Yeah. Is, it, is it not a bad idea to ask? Because they used to do that at B and I and said, "Look, you know, um, uh, I need to go away and think about it." And and I would actually ask, "Is there anybody else that you need to speak with uh, about this as a decision? It could be a business partner, it could be the accountant, it could be whatever." It's as well to know that. Um, and I always used to say, well, if you were then go, you know, if you were then to the, if it was somebody that was a business partner, I would want them to bring them back to the meeting so that they could see what that person saw. But we'll get, we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I, I am not used to putting down written proposal, proposals, but I know that some people in business have to do that. In other words, they have to bid for work. Do you typically have to bid for work, Nathan? Um, yes and no. So I'd say 25% of my stuff is, is a bid. And then the rest of it is when I would prepare a proposal is just to sort of for, for a new client, perhaps for the first time, just to give them a really good, solid overview of what we can do. Okay, so where does the proposal come in the sales pipeline? And I, I use that word deliberately because you're looking mm. to sell your services. So don't get, don't anybody get upset by that. Where is the proposal coming? Is it coming before you've asked before, you know, where? Um, it's usually kind of the third, second or third touch point. So I'd usually get an inquiry, have a chat with them, get all the information I think I need to be able to quote accurately. And then the proposal would be that third stage. And there's a link at the button, click here to accept, which sends me an email. And that, that kicks the whole thing into gear. Okay, so it's, it's so you're, ask, you're using, am I right? You're using the proposal as the close of sale and you're hoping that the proposer will make the sale. Yeah, yes. Rather than making the sale, agreeing it, and then putting the proposal to confirm what you've already agreed. Yeah, the former is the way I do it at the moment. Yeah. Right. Uh, anybody else do it that way or anybody else do it differently? Yes, Ollie. And then Rebecca. Yeah, I do it the same way in that um, people want to see what they're getting before they commit to it. So and the easiest way for them to see it, especially if there are other kind of stakeholders involved, is to put that in writing and then in a proper document and they can um, share it around. And I, I used to just literally put a price in an email and I lost, I think about one job through, through doing that. And they said that they went to another company who just put more information in and it, and it was exactly what I did in terms of offerings, but 
I just hadn't spelled it out to them in kind of big big letters. And so I took that on board and decided that I needed to, going forward, just put a proper written document, like sort of Nathan was saying, about um, what you kind of offer in it. So yeah, I follow the, the sort of similar pattern, I think. Okay, uh, Rebecca. Morning, Anne-Marie, by the way. Yeah, I think mine is similar too. I suppose maybe I'm calling a proposal a quote though, but maybe I should start, yeah. So it will have everything, we'll, we'll have discussed stuff. So it will have everything we've discussed, my idea of how that can be achieved and the price. And then I always put that, you know, if, if you have a certain budget or this isn't fitting what exactly what you want, let's discuss again. So there's sort of wiggle room. It's not like it's this or nothing. So you're actually giving them wiggle room. Yes. Yeah. You, you think that that's what they're, you're actually almost suggesting that you, you are prepared to negotiate. Is that right? Uh, in the sense that if they want the price to be lower, I'll do less. Right. So I, what I'm meaning by that is if, if you're giving them wriggle room, then yeah. it could be you, you're suggesting that you're not quite so sure about the price of us. I'm, I'm being the devil's advocate. Yeah. Actually, you're right. With the architectural work, I don't do any wiggle room. But with the um, business stories work, I do because I, it tends to be smaller businesses who where even a hundred pounds can make a big difference. Is that are you deciding that or are they deciding that? Uh, that's just through my experience. So, right. yeah. Well, yeah. I'm only being the devil's advocate. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're right. But I think that I, is through experience. Whereas, I, and I fretted sometimes with architects, like raising some prices, and then I realised, well, actually, I don't, I don't need to. You know, well, if I just we, say this is it, this is how it works, it well, worked fine. But with, but with business, business stories, it was definitely much more like you're dealing one on one with people who are very cautious about where their money's going. Uh, right, right. So, so you're making judgments in both cases. You're making a judgment that the architect, because he's an architect, can afford it, or the person mm. working from home or a smaller business maybe won't be able to afford it. So you're not quite so certain about that. Now, well, I'm generalising, but even even when I say architects, I mean in the construction industry. So some of these could be multinational companies. That, right. That's sort of what I mean. And and even the architects, it tends to be on commercial projects and they're sharing, not sharing the cost, but it's, yeah. Whereas actually dealing with residential architects is different. I have noticed that instantly they're, how much is it going to be? Like they're much more worried about the cost. So it, it's just, it's just sort of reacting to what this is, this is This is really interesting you know, they're much, much more worried about the cost. So because you raised the point last week about pricing. So that is an yeah. area that I think is maybe one that you're a little bit sensitive to. And that, that's OK. Uh, I, I learned a long time ago that um, what you've got in your purse or what Nathan's got in his wallet is none of my business. Yeah, yeah. It really is none of my business. And yeah, by the you way, don't know what people can or can't afford, but I do oh, know what how they feel about money. You get a feeling. Is it that, about your feeling about money? I'm only again. I'm being the yeah. devil's advocate while you while you're on it. You see, I went into the Apple store the day that the Mac uh, the uh, iPad Mini came out because I had a big MacBook Pro. It was too heavy. I wanted the Mini. I ended up with the Mini and updating my phone. <laughs> And I found the money. I'll put it on a yeah. credit card, actually. And it's Anne Marie and then Nathan. Morning, everybody. I have a bit of a voice today. Hey. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so something really interesting started happening with, with the quotes that I do. So when I speak to people, um, so beginner book is kind of morphing into something more than it was. And I'm offering lots of add-on services from people that I'm working with in collaborations and associations. So when I'm having conversations with people, um, I will say, oh, I can also offer this, da, 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 da. And I just say, I'll pop, I'll pop everything in the quote and then you can have a look and see what you think. 
So then obviously in the quote, I will put the service that I'm going to offer them that I've kind of agreed upon. And then I'll put all, list all of the add-ons um, in the quote, and then they've got a choice. And, and in the bottom, in the notes, I just say, you know, these are optional, but I'm just putting them there so that you can see what's available. I've done that three times now, and three times every single person has just accepted all of these add-on services as well. They've just gone, yeah, fine, no problem at all, and paid it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So the fact that I'm kind of just putting it there, even though there's no pressure, it's just me saying, look, this is available, let me know if you, if you want them or not. People are just going, oh yeah, why not? And kind of, well, that's how it's coming across to me anyway. It sounds like an upsell to me, but uh, which is pretty good, you know. Um, Nathan, you had a point. Yeah, just Rebecca on that, that point you made with the business stories. Um, something I've been doing over the last few months is when I'm sort of looking, you know, dealing with sort of smaller businesses is I haven't, I used to do what you do and you used to try and guess what they had, which is not good because you never get that right. But I've just been offering like payments over a number of months now. So a bit like um, Andrew Weston does. I've just got somebody over the line, for something that I'm trying out uh, on Friday. And, you know, he's doing something like 499 over six months, which I'm like, fine, doesn't bother me. And for him, it's 80 something quid a month. And that was the difference between him saying yes or no. So I just thought that might be something to consider when you're, you know, pitching the business stories is put it as however much per month over six months rather than the big block of cash. And it's just about changing how they approach the price, I think, yeah. at that point. And you need to add on like 1% or whatever it is if you do go cardless. But you know, I that that's so. got someone over the line who literally said to me last month, so I have absolutely no money for any marketing at all. And, yeah, you know, no, that's so. good. That's, and actually, the last quote that I did was a bit like that because I broke it oh, into great. sessions. Mm. So kind of unintentionally, it was I wanted to break up the price. And, and I did sort of upsell, I guess, by saying you could add the session and do this which actually they are going to go for. So it, oh, that's cool. but yeah, I think it's that. It's just sort of presenting it so it doesn't feel yeah. like this big lump sum mm, mm. That to a, like I would if, yeah. if I'm doing my marketing. I can't just sort of fork out two grand in exactly. a month. And also, I guess with doing it like that, even though I've got a few people who are doing a similar payment option there, so like the job will be done, wrapped up and edited in like two or three weeks, but then it's just a nice sort of little trickle as well for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that can help. Yeah, a good, good idea. That's a good point, we'll Nathan. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to get at is, and I'm beginning to understand it now, that maybe we're using proposals or quotes, written proposals or written quotes, instead of asking, instead of actually asking, are we going to be doing business together? Asking for the order. In other words, we feel a bit sensitive about that. You see, sales have got to be part of a pipeline. There's a sales pipeline. Um, and the st it starts with, am I, front am I in front of the right audience? Am I in front of an audience that has got a problem, that needs the solution I can provide, <clears throat> and maybe has got the money? So if, 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 if you're continually offering sort of, long-term payments and a 500 pound website over six months is incredible I, uh, i'm trying to work on two bits of business for you at the moment andrew by the way but i won't cool. mention any extended payment because i want them to do the business i want them to get them in front of you um but if i had the mind about sensitivity about money i would add in oh by the way you can pay for it over six months you know that's revealing a weakness on my part so Am I in front of the right audience? Are they the decision maker? And have they got problems that I can solve? And I think that is the main thing we need to be thinking of. And it's in the conversation, your own personality, you're looking to take them from where they are now to where they could be. So somebody else said, uh, I think it was Ollie said, they need to see what they're getting. It's for you to show them what they can get, you know, in the conversation. You want to know what is it they're wanting to do. And it's not just I want a new, smart, new website. What do you want that website to do? What will it mean to your business to have 
it looking like that or um uh, you know, to, to bring this functionality in, what is it about your own site at the moment that you're frustrated with? What is it not doing? Um, these are the, the, it's in this engagement and this sales process, this, this interest and finding out what are the challenges, you know, if they're here and they need to get to there, what is it that's stopping? What stopped them? What's the barrier they, they no longer, you know, why, why haven't they done it before? Have they tried somebody else and not done, succeeded, et cetera? So I think that, that the sales process is, is really getting deep into that and all along adding the value that you bring to the party and then asking at the appropriate time, asking for the order, it, you know, are we going to do business? Because I think a lot of people are frightened of asking for the order. I don't say on here, but some of us will be. I know I've been in the past. I've been reticent and I was a professional salesman. Uh, Nick and I think uh, Andrew and then Rob. Yes. Yeah, I know I can be guilty of this, Paul. I don't know whether, whether anybody else kind of gets into this position occasionally, but sometimes when you're in a, a sales conversation, the, the conversation can rush by really quickly. Um, either the client time pressured, hopefully you shouldn't be time pressured because you've, you've made time for the call. But um, I think I constantly have to remind myself to slow the conversation down and make sure I'm asking the right questions. Um, so as you've just said, Paul, you come away actually knowing as much as you possibly can know before you start talking about price. So I, you've actually got the value across in that conversation. But it, I, sometimes I, it doesn't work like that because... Well, I, I think it's I think it's a, a mindset that the meeting you're having to help somebody is a valuable meeting. It can't yeah. be rushed. And if somebody, I, I if, if I was meeting somebody to talk to them about business, and I was meeting him in their off, uh, off, I would want to get them out of the office. I don't want to be interrupted by the secretary. Keep putting calls through. There's no way. I, I, I won't. You know, I'll stop the conversation. And I'll say, you know, this 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 meeting is important to you. It's important to me. I think we need to take some time. You're the, the you know, the, the issues that you've got are more important. Um, uh, and I think that would be a professional way to do that. Depends on the value of the meeting and the value of the sale at the end of it. If it's, you know, low ticket item that you can do, you know, you can do it in a different way. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, just to say on the six month thing. So the reason I brought that in wasn't just due to a sort of um, nervousness on my part for asking for the, the cash. I think you, you bear in mind the space that I operate in, which is people with low budgets. As Rebecca's alluded to, you know, price is really important to those people because they're, they're having to apply for funding or the cash straps and, and that type of stuff. So actually to say to people, um, because I used to do 50-50 and that doesn't work because what happened is then people kick the can down the road on the sign off. So you end up with half the money. And this is my experience of it, because you think that will work. 50% up front, 50% on, on sign off. Yeah, good luck to you. Um, it's a nightmare. So what I do now, you've got two options. You can either pay me the full amount up front, which is a lot of trust, but you're very welcome to do so. And some people prefer to do that, and quite a lot of my clients do do that. Or we can do, six, do it over six months, six equal payments. And that works a peach for a lot of people as well. And it's helped, it's helped with cash flow and all the rest of it, like Nathan said. You know, say you, even if it's low, low ball, like 500 quid, it's not a lot of money, but it's still, you know, if you've got 500 quid not burning the hole in your pocket, people cash strapped, they haven't. So I find the six month thing helps really well and it keeps the mind focused. They need to deliver what they need to do for me to do the job as well because they're paying every month. So it reminds them as well. So there's a psychology there as well. Yeah, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not against that. However, if suddenly their MOT on the car failed and the bill was six hundred pounds, they'd have to find it. Yeah. <laughs> but what I might do is to twist this round a bit, and maybe you charge six hundred pounds, um, which you can pay a hundred pound every month. That's affordable. Would you agree? But if you want to pay up front, it's five hundred pounds. Yeah, that's good idea. I'm moving that round if that's the way that modus operandi. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, you had a point. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I think uh, I've got an unfair advantage um, when it comes to this kind of conversation because I, I, can dis I don't need anything to display my product, which is 
uh, my coaching. So I take them through a coaching conversation or a coaching session. And sometimes <clears throat> I either indicate at the beginning of that conversation or at the end that I'm that I think we should both have a yes, a firm yes or a firm no at the end of the conversation. Um, <clears throat> and I think that really helps because it, it makes them focus. That it's like it's your, it's your one opportunity. Uh, your time's valuable, my time's valuable. So let's let's uh, have a really good coaching conversation and walk away with a firm answer. And that does a lot to focus the client and myself. And then um, in terms of the, the affordability, um, I explained that the, what I'm doing is, is going to sit above a lot of things in their life because it affects everything in their life. So that's a nice pri- way to prioritize it. So I'm focusing on the results and, and the, the, the change it will make. And that does a lot of that footwork for me um, to, to, for them to assess the value of this product. So when you were all talking, it made me think, well, what is the problem that you solve and how often are you talking about that? Because I get to talk about that all the time because people come to coach because they want to you know, crack a nut and get past something. Um, and the payment plans I do up front or I do um, half and half. But of course, it's, it's not actually a you know, tangible product or service. It's, um, it's uh, people can stop when they want to uh, with enough notice. And I write that into my agreement, but I prefer to get payment up front. And that obviously commits people to the process as well. So you actually get an agreement uh, in your conversation at some yep. point when you've unearthed all the challenges and the solu- and, and, and you're confident that you can provide those solutions. They become confident in the way you approach this. Um, and then do you, then you confirm that after, after they've agreed. Yeah, so uh, then I say, yeah, so I I send a a coaching agreement. It's not legally binding and say, as soon as you make that payment, then we'll book in your first session. Yeah. Yeah. And do you negotiate? I I, I get the impression from the way Rob's speaking that he wouldn't negotiate on price. Am I right? I I hold two uh, discount slots for people that um, discount slots are a little bit dangerous for coaching because you have to find the right person. Um, for coaching to work, people have got to really turn up and embrace it. So the pricing is very, very important. You have to, it's like sorts the wheat from the chaff. Um, <clears throat> the two people, well, the one person right now who's got a discount, I know them fairly well and I know their circumstances and I'm, I've made a judgment call. I'm very happy to, uh, he, he's getting a 50% discount from me yeah. And I have someone else starting in November who's also getting a 50%. But I know they're both they're both going to turn up in the right way in the manner in which I would like my clients to turn up in terms of commitment and investment in themselves. And that's that's my kind of gift back to, you know, society. But everyone else, there's, there's no discount. I, the reason I say that is because of the, the, the confidence that Rob was executing there. I, I, you know, I wouldn't begin to think about discount. There's nothing wrong with giving a discount. There's nothing wrong with doing anything for free. And there's nothing wrong uh, with um, sort of whatever payment terms. You've got to know what you're getting from it. So if you've got to pay the mortgage at the end of the month and and cash flows tight, then whatever, that might be a decision. If you want to break into a new market and you want the portfolio put together, then again, there will be reasons to do that. Do that. Um, but the overall posture that Rob uh, makes, and by the way, in your conversation, posture is everything. You see, I think people buy based on confidence. They want to move from here to there, they, that you're going to provide a solution. They need to be really confident that you've got, that you're confident that you can take them there. And if there's any doubt, that might be partly influencing their, I'm not sure about this. <coughs> Won't be able to put the finger on it, but they're not sure about it. Anne Marie, and I think then Mel's got a point. Yeah, just kind of um, really echoing what Rob was saying there. I think it, a lot of it is exactly what you've just said about confidence. Um, and I've got a um, a little old lady that I'll use as, a, as an example. So I'll just turn my fan up. She's um, eighty, bless her. <clears throat> Incredible woman. She's got loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff that she wants to write. She turns up on my doorstep every couple of weeks with everything typed up that her husband lovingly typed up. So it, it's a beautiful story. 
but I obviously the the kind of like the part of me that feels really sorry for is like oh bless I need to do this for a really like cheap and free and whatever because she's but actually I kind of removed the emotion a little bit and I thought well hang on a second she's come to me she knows what I offer she knows what you know what the prices are going to be so I need to kind of hold my ground if that makes sense because otherwise I would end up doing everything for this woman for free and then I I you know I could spend my whole life doing her work so when she came around the other week last week and she sort of said oh you know how I'd given her the quote and the invoice and everything and she said so can I just be clear what this is going to give me and I was half tempted to add something extra in and I was like nope just stick with it and she was absolutely fine with it because I just said well you know this is going to give you as we've discussed bomb 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 she went, oh, what about that? I said, no, that's a different project and that's a different project. She's like, okay, yeah, no, that's fine. And then she phoned me when she went home and she said, um, do I need to pay you right now? Do you need it in your bank account right now? <laughs> and I said, no, it's fine. You can bring a check next because she doesn't do online stuff. So I said, it's fine. You can bring a check next time. But I think it was really difficult because you do have an emotional connection, or I do anyway, and, and you do kind of think, oh, you know, bless, I want to... And I had to be fair, you know, I, I have probably given her a better deal than I would if um, Jeff Bezos came to me. <laughs> That'd be fun, wouldn't it? Um, but, you know, in, in some respects, removing that emotion was really helpful. So yeah. that was all I wanted to say. I can just picture her coming, walking up that hill with a couple of bags of cash, <laughs> pound notes. I've got, well, um, Marcus has seen him. I've got Wilberforce, the rabbit, to photograph, which Marcus has, has seen as well. That's a whole other story, but she's incredible, this lady, honestly. Well, I, I have a very dear friend uh, that uh, who Rod knows, <clears throat> and Rod's, I think Rod's seen it. Um, she is 84. She's only just does the internet. She rings everybody, and uh, except a gardener cut her telephone wire off the other day, um, and she'll write to people. And uh, she is so spirited. Uh, she has no less than a thousand pound cash in a handbag at any one time. That's the <laughs> way it is. So, and she's so smartly dressed, but you would, we make age judgments on people. And, and yet, by the way, I know, I, she's always she's told me, I know how much that person's worth. Uh, so never dismiss little old ladies or whatever as to what they can afford. Never dismiss what anybody can afford. and Because even if they can't find it, if they want the value and want it bad enough, then they will find it. It's a case of their priorities. Um, somebody else had their hand up there for a minute. No? Uh, sorry, Mel, it was you and then Rod. Yeah, my, my business is, is quite different to what we've just been talking about because... I'm almost in the same situation as sort of legal, you know, no win, no fee, because my my business is based on finding candidates. And if you can't find a candidate, then you don't really get payment for that because it's based on a percentage of the candidate's annual salary. And that can be anything from 15 to 20 percent, depending on what I can get. And and I based it then on 50% invoiced on the appointment letter and 50% invoiced on start date. And that's what people want. They come along to me. They're not, you know, so what's your turn to business? They're on the website. Oh, now what I mean is how much is it going to cost? So I say, well, 15%. They say, okay, go ahead. I then file the people over. If they like them, they take them. If they don't, they don't. Okay. I mean, with their every industry, there's, there's a... A ground rules for pricing, I suppose. Um, I'm just going to share the screen uh, just for a moment, just to make some points. And then I want to come to this. Sorry, Rod, you had a point. Yeah, all I was going to say was, I think the thing is that, um, as Mar as Rob says, you know, the, dealing with a, from a position of strength <clears throat> and exuding confidence, you are the professional. They are coming to you or you're going to them because you've got to put, you know, something, you know, you can help them. And um, I think, you know, that often does tip the balance. You know, I, I, I find when I'm, I'm dealing with people on the detail, um, they're expecting me to be very detailed because they either spoken to someone else or they've had a referral from someone else or read my reviews. So I think it's important to just follow that through. I, I think 
we we could have another discussion completely on different pricing and upsells, downsells, discounting. That that could be a really a different subject. That could be a full subject in itself. All I know is that a lot of that is to do with the audience and the value you bring. Uh, I can tell you that it costs you nine on a thousand pound to be a be an I member in the first year, including VAT. I don't know what the latest figure is, but it's about nine hundred pounds plus your breakfast fees if it's an on-site meeting. Okay, and yet you can belong to a business focus for a lot less than that. And there's a lot of people will go there. And yet, I think B and I have got 35,000. I don't know how many members they've got now, 100,000. I don't know. But uh, they generally have about 12,000, 14,000 members across the country. So, you know, so is price that, is it about price? Uh, I have a little smart car, uh, which I love, uh, but I've, I've got people driving around in Mercedes. I've got people driving around in Porsches. I can't think. You know, these people buy Amiga watches. I can't stand them. I mean, I just, I think they're ugly, but then I'm in the minority, you know? So it, pricing is about being in front of the right audience. The right, there's an audience for all prices, really. And I think also when you, 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 you register your price, that actually says something, it, subliminally, there's a perception there. The higher the price, you, there's all things being equal, Somebody that is, you can be in, you can really be too cheap. Uh, and I've, I've always found that if you've, if you are, and this is in commodity pricing, if you're, if your price is low, you're having to sell quality. If your price is high, you're still selling quality. Even if you've got a low price, because the other person thinks, well, is it any good? So therefore you start, talking about the quality of it for the money, et cetera. You, I'm, a, I'm a clear on that. Let me just, uh, let me just share this screen. Um, what we've actually got is uh, a buyer here and the reward there. It's the best graphic I can steal off the internet. Uh, and there's a gap. And that's where the sales pipeline comes in, the sales process. You've got somebody here that you've met uh, on um, because you've reached out. You think they, they are a, a, you know, a client that you'd like to deal with that is likely to have the issues that you can solve, i.e. maybe in arch architects. It could be that you've done some uh, ads, some social. Uh, it could be you're either outreaching, as I've just said, or because of the content and the value you provide, it's an inbound inquiry. It doesn't really matter, but there's a gap. There's a person that's stuck there on the left and they want to get to uh, the, the end point on the right. Now, they may know what their end point is, especially if they've come to you um, because of the content they've realized, the content that you produce, they've realized that you're probably the person to go to because you've, the content and the issues you, you're covering um, are actually resonating with them. But this, but so now the gap in the middle is the conversations. And if we look at that, we've got, a, so we've got a prospect and where they are at present i.e. where they are in their business, what their challenges are, what all about their business. You don't know at, at that point what their disposable income is or what their access to finance is. So there's lots of questions you've got. And also you've got that future situation because the prospect may have in their mind what that future situation is going to be like. On the other hand, they might have, they might have lowered their sights you may be able to see something in that person or something in that person's challenges, and you may be able to deliver more than they expect. But somehow the bit in the middle is the barrier. They, is it a, a barrier that, they, that the prospect has got um, mentally? Why, have they why, why, why can't they just fix? Why can't they just leap over? Why, why, you know, why? You need to know that. You need to know their present situation. So many questions you could ask that prospect. That's why you do need time. 
And that's why you need to know the questions to ask. And the more you do it, the more you get used to asking questions. So that in the middle is the problem. That's the problem that they want. That's the barrier. That's the thing they want solving. Uh, and of course, you're the one that provides solutions. And I heard something the other day that on the internet, most people go on the internet to provide, to find solutions to the problems they've got. Um, that's why I think internet marketing can be very interesting in getting you in front of the right client. So the first part is questions. No question about it. There, <laughs> that's a bit funny. Uh, the, the first part is questions. That's why, and, and we've, we've all, We've covered this on a number of weeks about the salespeople that come along uh, that just don't know what they're doing. The people on social media, the people on LinkedIn, they don't ask any questions. They just pitch in with what they think is a solution, how they can help you. And, they've got, and it irritates. Uh, so I think one's got to become really good at asking questions. And that's why everybody in here can be good at sales, because it's just a matter of asking the right questions. So you don't need to be flash and pushy ever. You just need to be caring, interested. You need to know, is this somebody I can help? What's their position? Uh, you need to get into uh, them and not just accept the first answers they give. Delve a little bit deeper uh, so that you've got a really good picture. Don't rush to produce your solution. Problems require solutions and you can propose solutions. Uh, and you need to say whether they think that's doable. Um, is it something? And you need to know whether they think it's doable. But at some point, you need to ask a decision. You need to ask a sale. And a lot of people are frightened of asking for the sale, asking for the order, asking for let's, shall we go ahead? When shall we start? I don't know. There's all sorts of slick answers, but I don't think you need to think about that. You need to know. You all, we've all said we need to know where we are. But the trouble is we think that we potentially could lose a sale at that point. So maybe we're tempted to lower the price because we think that maybe, maybe that's what's necessary to get it over the line, except that we've provided, so we've found that we know how to help the person. We've asked the questions. We've got agreement that those solutions are doable, they're workable. Just got to say, shall we do this? And we think we're going to lose the sale at that point, and we're not. It's actually just a way of asking, uh, taking, uh, um, keeping score. It's collecting a decision. That's, that's, I, I hate the word closing the sale. It sounds manipulative, but uh, you're just collecting a decision. You're just, seeing, you're just keeping score. Where are we up to? Because if they say, yeah, let's go ahead, then there's a fit. If they raise an objection, we get worried about objection. I know I did. I think that was it. They didn't like me or, or whatever. Actually, they're just saying, well, actually, actually, I still, this is the barrier. That barrier is still there. I'm not sure. If they raise an objection, it's generally, actually, because there's still some things that are not quite right in their mind. And you need to know how to explore that to reassure them, maybe. Uh, and then get back to asking for that decision again. Um, and the pipeline, I'm gonna readjust the words on this. <clears throat> the pipeline is what we, we need to bear that bigger picture in mind. So I'm just gonna stop there for a moment. Stop the share, take that off, take that out of the way and I've got everybody back. Is that right? So is that, is that a nice, easy way to think about this? You know, it, and that's why I think if, you, if, if after you've, you've had this discussion about what you can do for them, it could be very easy, Nathan and Rebecca, to say, well, let me, let me send it in as a quote so that you can, so the quote can decide it. Uh, and that is, I think, the wrong the wrong way to use the I think a, again if somebody says well if there's several businesses bidding if you're in a, a bidding situation for say a government contract or whatever uh, then maybe it's different and there are proposal specialists that do that and it's not an area of my expertise 
But nevertheless, putting a bid in without some sort of dialogue, I think it's, you might as well not waste, not waste your time. Otherwise it's a race to the bottom, even the lowest. And I know a lot of governments have got to have the lowest price, but I don't think that's a wise decision for them or anybody else, you know? Uh, Rebecca, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I think like with the quote or proposal that I give, there's always been a dialogue beforehand, but I think you're right that I'm very reluctant to talk about money in that dialogue because it feels awkward. So I think that's something I'll have to get better at, just being want, straight in my pricing. I want to make the point it, it feels awkward to you, not yeah. necessarily to them. You, we are imposing yeah. this, how we feel on them. It's, I was once... Um, I once read a story about a young man that got a job in LA in a menswear store. And uh, he really was, uh, he was pretty good. He enjoyed his life, he enjoyed his job, et cetera. And uh, <laughs> the owner of the store came around to see what he was doing. And he, he, he sort of stuck, stuck around all day. It's what I used to do as an area sales manager. I'd stand back from the conversation. It was always easier to see the overall conversation, just as it's easier for me now than being right in the front of it, you know? Uh, and I was a salesman, you, you've got so many things going on in this sales discussion, but when you step back, you're able to see both sides, you know? Anyway, this area manager came along and, um, or the owner came along and he was watching and uh, this salesman had a really good, a good uh, sale that day. A guy had come in for a suit, he showed him some shirts, showed him some socks, uh, actually sold him a raincoat as well. And I think the sale was about $1,000, which is the best sale he'd ever made. And at the end of the day, he was coming in for his appraisal. And uh, he said, um, uh, he said, I, I, I've enjoyed the day. And he said, oh, I felt really proud. That's the, that's the most I've ever done in a, in a, in a, a, a sale. I thought that was a record sale, $1,000. And uh, he said, When did he say no? And he said, well, he didn't. He said, well, how do you know he'd spent enough? And I thought that was very, very relevant. Now, okay, he was in that environment, but in other words, he'd made a decision that a thousand pound was his record and that surely that's as much as he gets. And sometimes we put our own value on things we underestimate our own value in the solutions we provide. Um, I mean, my, 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 any consultancy fee I would do is way out of whack because I haven't been involved in that uh, area for absolutely years. I mean, I, I talked to my eldest son about what he earns in his uh, business and what Rod's uh, son-in-law earns at Google or whatever. And, and again, you get out of touch or you start to believe that, you know, your own limitations on, on uh, price. Um, you didn't hesitate to buy a really expensive drone, did you? Because you felt yeah. it was of value, you know, but you could have got a cheaper drone. Why didn't you? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I... No, couldn't have really. What? Because for what I needed it for, it couldn't ah. have been... But the solutions it provided what I needed for, you yeah. could have one like mine. Mine was under mine was about four hundred under five hundred pounds. Could have bought one of those, but you didn't. Yeah, but I did a lot of research and I did look into that. And yours isn't as good in wind and things like that, and it hasn't got the same lens, the same quality of photo. Right. Yours is better for video. <laughs> you no, no, but that, yeah, but but it's it's about value for what you get, isn't it? So and I'd be disappointed. True. I'd spend 500 quid and I'd be like, well, I've spent 500 quid and not actually got what I need. And that architect could spend 500 pound on a photographer that wasn't anywhere near as experienced as you are. Can you see the point yeah. they're making? Ollie. Uh, yeah, I was just, think, just thinking actually about my process a bit more and that uh, I think I use the the sending out of a proposal or quote as the kind of do you want to work with me bit because I will put um yeah I give them a rough obviously idea of price in email or through conversation to decide then whether it's worth me 
putting in the effort to do the proposal. So, you know, it takes about an hour or so of my time that I don't want to be doing it if I don't feel like it's going to go anywhere. So I often kind of will give them a figure and say, are you happy for me to send you a formal proposal? And then most of the time it then turns into a job. But I think, I mean, going back to, I think, Nathan's original kind of point really about um, proposals which are just kind of out there sitting in the ether and no one's responded to. I think I've got about three or four out there. And I probably ought to, at some point, give them a call and just say, have you read through it? You know, is there anything else you need from it? And maybe there just needs to be a better follow up process, I think, with those original proposals and whether it might be the fact that they, you know, they decide they can't afford it or whether they gone elsewhere. But I think, yeah, for me, I, when I think about it, it probably just needs to be that kind of follow up procedure. Most of them are decided 24 hours, probably about two hours after the, you've left them. I'm going to give you some frightening statistics that I picked up the other day. Um, just before I go to Anne-Marie, do you ever, and it, it's different for everybody here, it certainly wouldn't be this quite the same for Rob, but do you actually ask them what a client, you know, if somebody's got a website, they're selling something. Do you ask them what that client is worth? Do, do I ask them what their... What, I, I, what their sale, you know, the uh, website might be information only, but it also might be to get sales. So, yeah. Uh, um, so a photographer, so Rebecca, for instance, got a website. She knows what a client is worth. Uh, do you ever ask that question? Uh, occasionally it's, yeah, and that is something probably ought to do more so is to find out, yeah, the difference if they had, a, I guess is what you're saying, if they had a better website, they're going to get more of those clients than it's going to be worth bring them more in and then they can see the value in the work, which I do. But yeah, it's not something I ask enough of, I would say. I, I think it's quite important because that, that mm. can then put the, you know, that, that adds to what they're going to get from it, what they believe they can get. And, and, and it also tells you, is this reasonable? You know, will this deliver? And you may say, well, actually, the website in itself won't automatically uh, deliver that. Or, or if it delivers the same, then we're OK. But what mm. we also need is we need to be getting more traffic to that website and you're not getting enough traffic to the one you've got. So traffic's more of an issue. In fact, I was talking to Rod about this uh, yesterday. He was talking about updating his website and I said, does it really need updating or does it need more traffic? Uh, and, it, and it posed a good question, you know? It might need both. Uh, or he might be just looking to update it because he's bored with it. But again, the conversation you'd have, you'd know where you were at. That, that's what I mean. It's mm. quite value to know what a client is worth. Uh, uh, Anne-Marie. Was it Anne-Marie? Yes. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, Ollie, um, obviously from experience, I've been through your onboarding process or whatever it is called um I was always going to work with you so the fact that you sent me the proposal didn't really make any difference the only decision to be made was do I pay it all in one go or do I pay it over a series of months but you'd already kind of sold me with with the conversations we'd had I knew that you knew what you were doing I knew what you could offer me I liked your way of working your ethics all of that kind of stuff so I kind of think you wouldn't be wrong to ask for the business at an earlier stage if that makes sense that's that that's yeah. interesting. Thank you. um earlier in the in the discussion we uh well, in the discussion, we've talked about people that have got proposals out and they're just waiting on. They don't know what to do next. OK, that's the problem with the proposal. The same problem uh, exists. Does anybody ever get the situation when you've been in a conversation? They say, uh, and I think Rob alluded to this. Um, can I think about it? Does anybody get that? What do we say? What do you say, Nathan? I've got a bit bolder with that now because I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier that there is some resistance there. So you're like, I did a bit of sales training with it on this last year, actually. And Martin, the sales trainer, told me to sort of ask about, like you said, who else is involved in the decision because that can be a basically code for it's, it's out of my hands. And then also to ask them, like, you know, well, what, what, what exactly do you need to think about, if that makes sense? You know, so like, there's obviously there's obviously something there's an objection there or there's a kind of 
I don't know, beginning of a, of a, of a bad thought or also it might be that they're speaking to other people and they haven't told you that as well. I think it's fair that you know that because, you know, it's obviously your, your time you're spending sort of talking to them and trying to help them as well. So just asking nicely, like, oh, is there anything I can sort of help you with now while you're actually, while you've got them in front of you? Because I think as soon as you hang up or you leave the office or whatever, then, yeah, it's probably one of your frightening stats there that as soon as you leave and they make their mind up. So if you can try and nip those things in the bud, like, straight away, then I think that's that's a good approach. That certainly helped me a lot before. And at least you get some kind of clarity about where you're going as well. So if they're like, oh, I'm speaking to five other people, then it's like, nice, okay, not the best. But if you just leave them to think about whatever it is and you're like, oh, okay, great, then it seems like you're almost sort of closing the door on it yourself a little bit, I think. I think I think a number of those things you, you definitely need to know for earlier on, you know, i.e. there's anybody else in the decision, you know, in the decision process. And I suppose, especially if you're talking to architects, they could be partners or other people in the there. Uh, was there somebody else I think had uh, got? Yes, Rob, when somebody says I think, about it. Yeah, to build on a bit on what Nathan was saying, it's um. You know, all of our time is valuable and to get two people together to talk about something is like a, it's a special moment. Uh, it takes effort. Um, why wouldn't you, uh, anyone, the client or us, intend to come to a conclusion at the end of that? When else is a, when else is a good time? And I think that sometimes the client need, needs to have that framed. Say, so we're doing something really important. We've come away from other things in our life. And we are now talking face to face or however. So let's let's get this sorted today and uh, and come to a, come to an art, you know. Well, I'm not saying I ever say that, but that is why I'm that is my intention. And yeah. I think it kind of sets out your stall. Um and it helps them find an answer. If they can't, then they're not right for me. Uh, in that moment. They're welcome to come back, but I'm I'm not gonna spend any more time because I just spent the best time with them. So yeah. that's as good as you're going to get. And if you need to do something else, that's fantastic. Go away and do that. But it's going to be another conversation. And there was no better time to make a decision apart from the end of that conversation. I think that there's lots of things come in, into somebody's decision. Timing is, it can be a lot of that. Um, mm. But when somebody says, I want to go away and think about it, believe me, they're not. Like if we think that they're going to go away and think about it, they're not. That's for sure. Okay, you might get the occasional person that comes back, but generally no. Rebecca? I was just wondering, uh, Rob, if... So that's not something you actually say to the client. Like, at the end of this conversation, we will get a yes or no. Or... Uh, I, no, I do say that, but not necessarily in that way. I just say the, the, the aim of this meeting is for you to decide whether you want to be coached by me and whether I want to coach you. And I am looking for a really good fit. And I always use the knuckle to say, this is a pretty good fit. I'm looking for that kind of fit. And I want you to have the same. Because if you don't, I'm happy to refer to somebody else, but it's got to be right. Yeah. So immediately they're like, oh, okay, Ooh, right, you know. Yeah, so they know that your conversation is gonna be about <clears throat> finding that fit. Yeah, so they yeah. pay attention and yeah. Right. Okay. And, phone yeah. on silent. I'm um, right. Brr. But <clears throat> maybe set that stall up prior to the conversation. So when they're there, they they are not in a room with a few other people knocking around, and you know uh, yeah. they're like, okay, right. I need to sort this out. Yeah. I I, I think also that that it, it's the tonality you say it in. You've got to use your own words. Um, but I think it puts value on Rob as well there. He says, you know, let's see whether. I like I, I've used that a lot in BNI in getting people to BNI meetings. Uh, never a problem because I say I don't know whether this is something that could be part of your marketing strategy or not. But why don't you come along and see whether there's a good fit with the people that are there? I don't use this bit, but I think I like that. Um, see if there's a good fit because what you what you're what you're subliminally emphasizing is can we get on? You know because that's that is the relationship there. That is a big part of their decision. Uh, Nathan. One thing I've been always very opposed to doing in these kind of discovery chats with people, I'm starting to think I might have to do it now, is to, is to kind of give a, 
a ballpark figure on the call. I just wondered what people thought about that. So to say like, okay, to do these videos for you would be from 1500 quid or whatever. And is it is it good to do that right, like immediately so you can kind of counter the resistance there and then? Or is it better to send a proposal like I've been doing with a more detailed quote? Or is it better to do both and say from this, but I'll, I'll double check the numbers afterwards kind of thing? Is that... Um in the initial inquiry that you're talking about? I guess that would be in the kind of, yeah, the sort of discovery call you have with them. So sort of step two of the process. Anybody want to offer anything there? Yes, Ollie? Uh, yeah, I think I think both names is, is good because uh, obviously people are phoning because they want to get, or booked in that call because they want to get an idea of price. And you need to know if, if you know, if someone's come and they've got 200 quid, you know, maybe they can't get what they want, but they can, you might say you can do something, you know, even giving them a bit of advice about where they go next for that 200 quid. Um, and also, like I say, it's easier to talk through why, you know, the value you give and things like that over in that call, rather than if you send a proposal and it's 1500 quid and they look at it and they're like, shit, this is too much. But if you can gauge, can't you, on a call or when you're meeting someone like, from their face or body language, you know, whether it's yeah. or not. And it gives you that opportunity to kind of, not kind of be like, actually, can we do it? We can do it slightly cheaper, but to then just kind of give more of it. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, okay. Put, putting, um, putting the money out there first is, um, uh, it kind of defines everything already. So that's just like, if you went and searched for a, a room in a hotel and you went just off, off price, because the price is the big number that's, that's listed, you know, on TripAdvisor or whatever it is, you're immediately using that as your first filter. And, you know, clearly you provide a lot of service, a lot of value, Nathan. So I think personally, I would, want, I would generate the desire from the client to want to work with me or yourself. And then, and then they, then they, then that proceeds um, by the way, and this is how much it costs. That's and they already know. Thought, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, if they I like you, you they like you. You know, yeah. if you're fifty nine pounds mm. more than the next guy, who gives a toss? Yeah. Like, <laughs> they're, they're like, no, I want to work with him because he's going to mm. do this thing. He's mm. going to solve mm. this problem. And prices, yeah, okay, fine. That's mm. the, yeah. okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's really helpful. Sorry, I was very opinionated. No, no, it's good. <laughs> Uh, there's some frightening stats that I picked up, and I, I can't remember the. Uh, I will in the notes find uh, pick up on the uh, the research people that did it. Uh, it was about communication. It's about this subject of let me think about it. Um, when you've had a conversation with somebody, twenty uh, or a, a sales conversation, twenty four uh, twenty four hours later, seventy five percent of it is forgotten. 75. Perhaps that's why once you've made a decision, you ought to at least qualify in a, in a written proposal, not a proposal, a contract or so that the expectations are met or moreover exceeded. So you've got to decide on expectations. And, but 24 hours later, 75% is forgotten. 30 days later, 90% is forgotten. And of the 10% that remains, 5%, only 5% of that is accurately remembered. Now, what does that tell you? Somebody says, let me think about it, really. After uh, 24 hours later, most of what you've said is, is lost. So you really, as Rob says, you've really got to try and nail it there. And, and, I, and there's, there's, a, there's a few things I've done in the past, but... I'm going to cover a couple of things that, that, that I picked up on that I thought were very, very, very clever and really uh, real. I think the other thing that, um, well, I'll come back to that. Um, and when somebody says, I want to think about it, you could say, you know, when people tell me they want to think about it, it's really what's in their mind is one of two things. Uh, either they're not interested or they're interested but not sure. Which is it? So if, if Marcus was to say, 
if I was to quote Marcus and he says, and we've had a conversation and we've had a really meaningful conversation and I've talked about the advantages of working together and know exactly where he is, where he wants to get to, uh, et cetera. And I really feel quite confident I can help him get there. And I say, well, I, I, you know, this is what I propose and, and this, is, this is what it's gonna cost. Shall we, shall we do this together? And then Marcus says, I wanna think about it. I know that there's something in the back of his mind that's stopping him. You do as well. It's how do you get, so you need some more, you, you just take the score. This is where you are on the scale. This is, you know, this is where you are. So um, when, and I've done this at, at, at uh, b and I, I, when somebody says, I want to think about it, and that, that's perfectly okay. Uh, most people that tell me that it's because uh, either they're really, it's not for them, uh, or uh, they've got somebody else they need to discuss it with, uh, or there's something that is just not, not quite, and they need an answer to, and, it, and it's easier. And I don't really don't mind what you do, uh, but it, it's easier to get that out now. How can I help? You know, how can I answer that? And that's what I used to say, but I prefer this. Uh, when people say, I don't, uh, "Let me think about it," it's usually because of one or two things: either they're not interested and don't want to go ahead, or they're interested but not sure. Which one is it? you're actually asking somebody to make to, to give you one of those two things. And by the way, they said, I'm not, I'm not really interested. That's okay. You're not going to win all of you. It, it, actually, it's, you prefer to know than to be thinking about chasing, you know? Now, if they say, I'm not sure, this is the way it, uh, uh, this particular guy that I picked this up from said, actually, you're not sure. When people say they're not sure, it's one of three things. It's either there's not a fit, i.e. is working together, could be a personality, could be whether it's neither or not, not a fit, or the solution is really not functional, there's no functionality, it's not going to do what you think it will need to do for you in particular, or it's financial. Which one is it? So in other words, you are guiding them. You, you, are, you are channeling them down to get off the damn fence. <laughs> or it's, you know, people like, like to sit on the fence, you know, and especially if it's a considered purchase, you know, they need to consider it. But you're helping, rather than leaving to think about it on their own or to talk, the worst thing is to go and talk to their partner and try and describe it. They say, how much is that membership you're getting? So they don't know the full value. They, don't, they haven't got the answer. So I thought that was very, very clever. And I don't have that, uh, certainly the first two things, you know, uh, it's either they're not interested or they're not, you know, there's something they're not sure about, which one is it? Um, and then the fit, the functionality or the finance. Because if they say, actually, I'm not sure there's a fit, I'm, I'm not, I can't see this, or, or they say, you know, I can't see this working. Which bit do you not, you know, and that's that's okay. Well, which bit? And and it could be that you need to adjust the offer that you do or to change the way you work or whatever. Uh, but if it ends up at the finance, then you at least know where you are. You can you you know you can start to talk around the finance part, which is then that you can bring in the extended payments if if that's the issue. Uh, you might need if they talk about the finance, it could be. Uh, you need to go back to, to, to the, the fact that it's an investment and what it's going to produce in terms of return. Anybody want to pick up on any of that? Yes, Nick, and then Rob. I think that's a really kind of, it's a great approach, really, isn't it? Because what it allows you to do is it allows you to keep the conversation going. It, has, it doesn't just end. You've, you've then got more variables to discuss. And it may be they've just misunderstood what you said or... They're just not quite sure what they were looking for. And you can, make, you can then unravel that, unpick it, build it back up, add the value again, yeah. and, and still potentially get to a close in the conversation um, just by understanding their needs a little bit better. So it's, um, it's have the confidence to do it, isn't it? Which I think is the... I, I'm on, I'm on uh, the second uh, series of The Morning Show on Apple, which I find fascinating. But, you know, I'm, I'm watching it. I've got nobody else in the room. I'm, I've, you know, the lights are low and I'm really focused. But sometimes they'll say something and I think, 
what was that they said? I don't, I don't know where we are now. I've, I've lost the, tr the train of thought. So I'll go, I'll scroll it back. That, that can be in a sales situation. It's so easy to miss that whole communication process. We imagine that everything we say they'll absorb or understand. Rob. Yeah, I, I'm proposing to ask a question actually next time I encounter somebody who's not sure. I'm going to say, based on our conversation, why would you work with me and what value would I add to your life? And get them to tell me. And then I can just sit there and listen. And if they say something, and I know that there's something else that's going to go along with that that's going to add even more value, I can just sit there and take that in and, and have, again, as Nick said, keeping that conversation open, keeping it going. And then it might be, um, okay, and what, what other value are you still looking for? What is it? And then they, they're literally telling you what you can do to, to complete the sale. I know, I know this. I, I know that when you listen to professional sales trainers, they'll say, you know, on a scale of one to 10, one being, no, I definitely don't want to work, 10 being, let's do it tomorrow, uh, where would you sit? And then they say, oh, I'm a seven. And they say, well, what would it take to get you from a seven to a 10? That it almost is, it, I mean, you maybe have heard that for the first time. It's almost a bit contrived, but it, but the meaning behind that is is not bad. And I think, and, you, uh, sorry, yeah, go on, Rob. I think I think you're taking the emotions away from it with a numerical value. So, yeah, it may be, it may be, but you, yeah, no. I, 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 I like the idea. I think they're two very similar concepts. I think though that the if if you get someone to put in words what value and difference you're going to make in their life, and they can tell you that, that's different to a seven point five or a nine. Yeah, I wasn't saying I would use that. I've always found okay. it, I say it's a bit contrived, but the the the. The thought behind it is very sound. Uh, you are trying to find out where that person is on that buying decision. That's what you, you, you want to, is there a fit, you know? And you've just said something there that makes me, uh, that reminds me, especially those of you that in B&I and you've been given a referral, uh, this is a tip that I would have. Somebody stands up in a meeting and says, I've got a referral for you. Or you've said something in your one minute or your 10 minutes and they've suddenly written down on a slip or they've written down, uh, I've got a referral for you. Uh, and that's why I used to say, do not pass a referral uh, in the day, in the meeting because somebody said something because you don't know it's a referral yet. You, you, your intention's there, but you don't know. You've got to know what they're going to say about you, right? And so if you've got an a third party introduction, somebody's introduce you you, know, you need to know two things you need to know from the person to introduce you why why do you think this person's might need my services so try and gather some information and also uh, how do you think we're going to get on so talk about the, the the individuals and whether you well, you know whether oh you'll get on he's got a great sense of humor or uh, he's got a similar background to your own etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so find that out. But when you start to talk to the person, uh, part of the preamble could be uh, you've been uh, you, uh, you've been recommended to me by so and so. How well do you know him or her? Uh, where did you meet? Uh, out of curiosity, what did they say about me? <laughs> now, that would be a good question, wouldn't it? Oh, he says that, uh, that she said that you were really reliable and uh, you've got a good experience, etc. They are telling you already, a bit like what Rob just said there. Any other points on that? Any other thoughts as to how they would... Has it helped anybody that, any of that? Massively, yeah. Thank you, Paul. I think... Um, a great conversation. Okay. So I'm going to go around and find out what, what you've taken uh, out from that and what, if anything, you will do differently. That's slightly different. What, if anything, you will do differently. In a, and it's really being honest enough to say, well, in, uh, in my, my sales pipeline or, the, or the, the sales conversation, there's two things. There's the pipeline, that's getting... Uh, reaching out to the audience, getting leads, connecting with those leads, qualifying that, those leads, making a presentation, um, asking for the order, uh, 
using maybe some of those techniques. Maybe in some cases you will need to follow up. In some cases they're, they're, they need to defer, they need to you know, check things, but at least you know where you are. That's why it's important to follow up. And I think the other overriding thing is that Rob alluded to it. He's got so many people coming through this pipeline that he doesn't really worry too much about what they're going to say because he knows it's the quality and numbers coming through the pipeline. And if you really, if 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 you really uh, like a praying mantis or like this eagle that's looking down on this one client, they've got to say yes or no. Um, then you're going to be you you're going to get into a really bad mindset you need to part of this whole thing is making sure you've got plenty of people coming through so uh given the way your your own sales pipeline your own sales conversation what have you taken from today and what might you do, not might you do what would you do differently or what would you try differently uh let's come on to uh let's come on to rebecca first Yeah, what I would do differently. Well, what would you take from today uh, as to a slightly, you know, what do you think might help you in, in? Yeah, well, actually, it's I mean, it's such great timing as well, because I've got two sort of prospecting meetings. So I can take a lot of this in. This has really helped get my thoughts together for it. Um, and I think something Anne-Marie said about hold your ground was good that sort of this yeah this is what you offer this is how you work and you know don't sort of feel emotionally pulled into doing this or that kind of leave the silence if it's uncomfortable even it it doesn't matter just hold your ground and have have more confidence I guess and actually I think with these two prospects that I've got I, I do feel confident and I guess it's just transmitting that confidence that's yeah. what yeah, yeah. I need to make you, sure I do. You will never lose a sale when you ask for the order. You will just find out where you are in the conversation. Yeah, yeah. You will lose a sale if you never ask, or you're likely to lose a sale if you never ask. Some people yeah. need to be asked. Is that? Yeah, so yeah. We, yeah actually, if, if you're thinking about asking for the sale, just think, let me collect a decision. Let's see where I'm up to. It's quite good fun. It's quite, it's quite yeah. a good part, you know? Yeah. Uh, if you ask too early, then you've asked too early. In other words, you haven't really got to the root of the problem or you haven't really yeah. built the value up. And, 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 and therefore, you'll learn from all that. Uh, but yeah. if they're still interested in working for you, they'll say, well, I, I'm not so sure about so-and-so. So that's what you need to go back to. I was yeah. going to go to Nathan then, but he's gone for <clears throat> tea, so I'll skip to Mel. <laughs> Yeah, um, as I said earlier, you know, I'm I'm in a fortunate or unfortunate position of uh, nobody ever says to me, "I'll I'll think about it." It's a straight yes or no because they've got nothing to lose. You know, it's a it's a yes. Um, find me the candidate, and we, you know, the price is right. We know the service is right, so on we go. Really, so it was a bit strange one for me today because there's not really much I can I can you know, diversify into different areas to, for my offer. Okay, all right. Nathan, as it was you that prompted this. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, really helpful chat today. I think um, what I'm going to do differently is in that discovery call is, yeah, collect a decision, basically, and filtering them through the page of notes I've just taken as well about, you know, looking at the objections and resistance and... I'll think about it. I think that was a really good one as well. So, yeah, I think getting a decision at the end of that initial call should should be the aim yeah. for every further sales activity now. And then the proposal is a kind of it's kind of a gloss on the top and a written record of 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 the job we're going to do. Not have a look at this and sit on it. And then also with the follow ups as well, maybe being a lot quicker. So if they're going to forget it all within a day, maybe. Maybe you phone up within a day of that initial call if they do need to go and speak to somebody. Just remind you them before it's... Do somebody, you need to nail it. It's to say, well, uh, diary, another call. You need to mm. nail the time. Uh, mm. I think you've also got... You, tonality is very, very important. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, and I, I think Rob is Rob is very experienced in the way he's going about things. But you, you know, you want to make sure that it's your tonality, it's your words, um, mm -hmm. because if you're not careful, using sometimes when we use somebody else's words. Uh, it, it, it seems abrupt. It, it, it could appear ad, uh, abrupt because we're not used to put the tonality in. A bit like an actor mm -hmm. uh, will get a script, uh, but then the need to be directed, the need to be practiced yeah. that script, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, there's the voice inclination and, and what have you. But that's the really fun bit. And uh, uh, Martin, uh, you've been very quiet at the back, taking it all in. What about you? What's... Uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, it's sort of being more confident about what you offer, I think, and the benefits to kind of drive that sale. It's, you know, where you were talking about, you know, if your car goes wrong, you know, you've got to pay 500 quid. It's maybe it's another subject that could be talked about, you know, like the, this is what I can do for you. And are you going to, you know, are you going to sort of give me your cash? Because, you know, you know, that's, questioning where you position yourself and how you know that you can people can see the key benefits of what you do um i i think that um there's certain businesses it, perhaps in some ways it's harder for rob because he's got um it, it's not like everybody everybody's not the same it's the same with you everybody's not the same when it comes to design um but mm. at least you could it's, it's very difficult to say uh, you come with me these are going to be the benefits it's like rod it's like basically somebody dies they need to be buried and it's a sort of you know it's a you know it's a more obvious sale so it's it's kind of it, it, yes, it's, it, it's it, questioning him always making me question how do i say this is what i do and this is just going to be the benefits and then you push the sale from there i think uh, I think it's less about what they what you do. Uh, it's what they. What yeah, the be talking about the benefits. Yeah, what you're going to get from working with me, if you like. So. Okay, uh, Chris. The um, yeah, I found today useful. I mean, I'm uh, in some ways it raises more questions for me than it gives me answers today because. I feel like in some ways uh, the massage proposition is an easy one to sell and I, I could do that in my sleep. That's a simple one. This one uh, with the workshops is slightly more nebulous. So it's trying to work out what things I should be pressing upon people in terms of uh, the benefits of it. Uh, and I haven't had enough of these conversations just yet, Paul, with people to really put it in context, if that makes sense. I think it sounds like with your workshops, it's who is the audience? What is it they want from that? Or, you know, what is it they want yeah. from that? Um, I think maybe the answer to that is to get, is to maybe do, uh, maybe do a, some, tr a, a test, a trial, get a few people together. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm going to do something on Eventbrite uh, uh, in the next uh, month or so. But I've, I've got too much homework to do for the video um, workshops first. So I'll do that first and I'll, I'll, I'll do the event bright stuff afterwards. I think that's the right order. Yeah. Ollie. Um, yeah, it's been really good today. Um, loads of takeaways. Um, one from Andrew was the fact that I need to kick a couple of people out the butt that owe me 50% on jobs. Um, but mainly for this, I think the... Um, uh, kind of what Rob said about generating that desire in the client and that ties in I think a bit with what you were saying Paul about almost giving them not just hard stats but finding a balance there that you're kind of the emotional nature of it but also some of the the real value that they're going to get from working with me what difference that's going to make maybe financially to their business you know how it could change them over six months you know or, or so and so I think yeah that was kind of unrelated maybe to proposals but well, no, it's not because it is part of it. But yeah, that's probably the biggest one for me today. Thank you. I think that uh, people buy people first. And I think we said it on, a, on an earlier call that, you know, it's about branding you. Um, people don't buy companies, they brand the individual, probably with the exception of uh, 
uh, Apple, although the service I got from the individuals that I met there was absolutely excellent. Uh, not, it's not common in the high street anymore, but um, uh, people will buy you, you know. So I think that's very important. Rob. Does look like a helicopter pilot, doesn't it? Looks about about to take off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really hot here in Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, just happened to be wearing a life jacket. Um, the um, I think the asking asking that I'm going to try and ask that question uh, about you know based on our conversation, what value am I going to add to your life? Is a, a good thing to experiment with. Um, I have caught myself uh, saying uh, justifying the money um, when someone says, oh, that's, that's quite a lot of money. I think that's the time for me to say nothing uh, around money mm. and just let them sit with that because it, it, it is. And uh, um, I have to be comfortable with that. And Rebecca, going back to uh, money beliefs, I've worked on my own money beliefs before now. I've actually worked with a money coach before now, which is quite interesting. Um, I'm happy to connect with you about that uh, or anyone else about money beliefs because I think it's a really big um, uh, player in what we do, but it can kind of, you know, sort of go unnoticed. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, especially if you've been brought uh, where money has been tight, you know. Mm. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, loads of, loads of little nuances, I think. I think one of the things that got touched on, which I heard recently, actually, as well, was volume equals confidence. And you're absolutely right. If you've got one job in and you absolutely need that job to pay your mortgage, you're in trouble before you've got going because people sense that desperation almost, I think, I come across. Whereas if you've got a number of projects, a number of clients, and you're in a situation where you're having to put people in, you know, it could be a month down the road or in two months, et cetera, that does actually give you a lot of confidence. Um, you know, when, when you're having those conversations and invariably, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll click. Uh, on that same note, Andrew, uh, again, coming back to B&I, uh, the thing I, uh, one of the things that B&I chapters have to do, they need to be continually inviting. They get comfortable, especially after a launch, you know, suddenly got 24 people in the room, they get comfortable, they think that's it. And um, one of the challenges of, of actually inviting people is that they start to think of the result. You know, we want people as a member. You might be thinking about somebody uh, to, to, to buy that, your services, et cetera. And when you get down to us, if you get down to a situation where there's not enough people doing that and you've got some pressure, you need to stop and focus on the activity that it takes. Don't focus on the results of conversations. Focus on the activity, because you can't control the outcome of any meeting. You can try and influence it. But if they, at the end of the say, no, I'm not interested in working with you, you haven't got any ultimate control on that. But today, you have got control over the number of people you reach out to. And by the way, I've come to realize this myself. You know, I, I put all sorts of things together, but for various reasons, not put, the, not put them out there. You know, so again, there's that, that mixture, so you're right there. Uh, Anne-Marie. Um, yeah, lots of things. Could I ask a question? Um, you mentioned obviously following up, which is something that I am notoriously bad at, not because I don't want to, but because it just kind of, everything else happens and it, and it doesn't happen. Um, how soon is too soon to follow up? So obviously you talked about the day um, that by, you know, by 24 hours, they've forgotten 75% or whatever it was that, that the figures were. But if say I've had a conversation with someone and then I've ended the conversation, then I immediately send them an email because that would work for me in terms of remembering, not remembering, but actually, you know, doing it because I'm still talking about that particular client. Does that not come across as a bit desperate? It depends what's in the email. Cheers, Rob. Well, it would be it would be the quote. So you know, if if you go through, um, you know, yes, we've had this conversation. Happy, blah 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 blah. blah. Yeah, I'll confirm everything to you in an email. 
or I'll send you the details or whatever, you know, however that conversation goes. Well, my, 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 my question would be, when, when would you like to start? Shall we get diaries? When would you like to start? Yeah, and I, I guess I do that. It was more the, the whole follow-up process that we've talked about um, today is I worry that if I send an email too soon after a conversation, people think, oh, God, she's that desperate. She's got to email me straight away, which I may well be desperate, but I don't want them to know I'm desperate. If, 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 if you've had a conversation with somebody, it's been a good conversation, maybe it's resulted in, it's resulted in a decision, um, why wouldn't you? I mean, I, I go on, on meetings, uh, network, the network, the business focus, and they'll get an email as fast as I can get their details into my system and hit bang. In fact, when Rob came on the call, uh, before I could get back to him, he came back to me on LinkedIn and said, I love it. You know, it, it fits in with what I want to do. Can I be part of the group? So I don't, I, you know, I don't think there's a, a problem with that. It depends what's in your email, you know. If, 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 if the person says no and you're writing and saying, please reconsider, they might think, uh, think something, but I don't think you're talking yeah. I guess it's a, yeah, I guess it's a perception thing, isn't it? And maybe that's something I need to, to figure out is my perception. Because if somebody emailed me straight away, I would be like, oh, OK, just back off a bit. But uh, then... Well, leave it to the afternoon or leave it to the... The point is, as long as you're following up, that's the key thing. <clears throat> as long as you, you know, and then you need to say, you know, can we stay in touch? And then you've got to estimate... Is it a three-month touch or? I mean, I've 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 sent you a couple of things, haven't I? Uh, a couple of podcasts and that you found useful. Did you, you know? I sent those just after I'd listened to them because I thought of you. It's just a way of staying in touch in between, you know. Uh, Nathan. Yeah, I was just saying one thing that has helped me a bit as well is when you are doing that follow-up after like a discovery call or something is to actually just pick up the phone you know even if it's a maybe I'd, I'd be doing that after a day now I think actually if someone doesn't need to go away and think of it and I think I don't think it's pushy but I think it's fair and you've given them your time and then there's obviously been something that they need to go and discuss with somebody and especially with Paul's writing statistics too I think there's no reason to sort of phone up and be like oh you know I don't know anything else I can help you with. Just wanted to see where we are. Are we going ahead? You know, um, I think I've changed my view on that. Now. I, I think that's absolutely fair. I don't think it's pushy at all. Um, I think the are they going ahead should be before. It should be the end of yeah. the um, Yeah. But you know, you know what I mean for that, that, that follow up. That, oh, I, you know, it takes time to change habits. So I'm just pushing you back there. Uh, and, and frankly, no, I, Anne Marie, I can't believe anybody would take offence at you following up because you're so friendly yeah. and cheerful. So I think I don't know whether you just raise that because you're thinking of something, a particular case, or. Um, but anyway, you'd be I'm surprised. Sorry. <laughs> surprised. You'd be surprised. Apparently, I can be quite scary. So you wrestle them <laughs> to the ground, do you? <laughs> I'm going to be quite scary. Uh, and finally, Marcus, uh, I, I like the backdrop. I like the the light, uh, the the light hood, and the tripod. The, the light hood. The light. Hood. <laughs> call it the, the spotlight. The spot softbox. That big thing there. I've got, yeah, there. Yeah, it's very. Yeah. It frames you very well. Uh, Marcus, yeah. what about you, what have you got from today? Well, you know, very enjoyable meeting as always. And I have got a big mark uh, next to delve a bit deeper. Don't rush on the sales calls. I think that's a big one for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I will say there's something else that is going through my mind during this conversation. And that I think to myself, well, you know, I hate all this stuff, sales and all that. <laughs> you probably know. <laughs> Why don't, I, why don't I just get better at what I do and let more people know about it and then not worry about trying to close a sale? That's what I, that's what I tend to think, I must admit. I've had, you know, I really like it when people phone up and the first thing they say to me, I, we really want to work with you because then I know I don't need to do anything. I, don't, I just want more phone calls like that, really. 
Well, I mean, that would also uh, be good as well. But again, you still need to, to go through this process, you know? I don't know, Paul. Yeah, yeah, you do. I know you do, you, you know. But if, I don't know, if, if someone wants something, they're going to buy it, no matter what it costs or who, who's doing it. Yeah, but who are they going to buy it from? <laughs> well, yeah. Somebody, yeah, I know. I'm sort of playing devil's advocate right at the end, so uh, I just, you know, I'm, yeah. Not I, 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 you know, I'm very much aware of the way most people think about sales because they've not been exposed to sales in the right way. Um, I think I, what was it? I shared. Uh, where was it? Well, can I just say? I think Marcus has got a really good point there. I think if you built that value. It does make the whole process so much easier, doesn't it? Um, it does. I mean, it's the way you it's the way you hold yourself. It's the way you talk to people. It's the way that you yeah. you're interested. Does this not say it all? If you walk in with information about you, they consider you a salesman. If you walk in with ideas and answers, they consider you a resource. Resource. Yeah. That's the, I mean, I guess the thing that I do and we do, and I'm a student in this group, is our product is right there, isn't it? It, it, it is, but but um, yeah, it is. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not, all I'm saying is that you don't have to come across as a salesperson. Oh yes. You need to be aware of what you're trying to do. You're there to help somebody take a journey from moving from where they are now to where they could be, or want to be, or should be. You know, how many times do we see something in somebody that they don't see in themselves? That's the way I look at it. And uh, I think everybody on this call is in this group is of a helpful nature. Definitely. And I think our role is to help people make the right decisions so they don't make the wrong decisions. You know, to, to understand value and, and uh, quality and... Uh, that you, you, you're going to get what you pay for. Surely that's it. Uh, and, and whereas most, pe most of your competition will be just talking about what they do. That's right. And I'm, what I'm trying to get over is that that's not important. It's the, the person in front of you is more important than you are. The per person in front of you, you're going to, you want to know how you can help them get from where they are to where they want to be or where they need to be, or maybe where they should be, but they're not even aware of it. You're, it's a helpful position, but you can only do that if you've had a meaningful conversation and there's a good fit and, what, and they see value in what you're doing. Because if they don't, or they don't see they need to move, there's no sale, you know? And that's okay as well. It doesn't mean to say you can't nurture the relationship, because if they get a good impression of you, that's why you're not going to chase everybody. I mean, you, you know, you can't be all things to everybody. That's that's all I'm saying. Now, I've not left anybody out, have I? Good. Thank you very much indeed. I hope you enjoyed that. Is there, if there's any other issues you'd like to uh, discuss here, maybe pricing's one in which we need to delve into, maybe. I know we've done it once, but it but bearing in mind it was some time ago, so probably 90% of it is forgotten. <laughs> uh, uh, Could we do feedback, please, in one session? Sorry, feedback. You know, like these feedback forms that people send you that you go yes and no and you don't take any time to put anything in. Um, the value of those and how best to achieve valuable feedback? Yeah, that could be good. Feedback, uh, surveys. Thank you. How did we do? Oh, Rob said he, he had something he could share in terms of our attitude to money and, and pricing. That might, if he was, if he'd be happy to share something like that, that might be an interesting yeah. topic. I'll tell you what would be good. If, if, if because of what we've talked about today and with deference to Rebecca, then we should be talking about pricing again. And if we talk about pricing and, and I'll liaise with Rob and we can do, I can set the ground rule, you know, the ground uh, base. And then uh, Rob could come in. Would that be good? If he's up yeah. Yep. Yeah. And just um, one thing that Marcus said, which I think is so true, is about if you keep just putting out good um, 
examples of your work, work will come to you. Like the best referrals are when they've seen your work and they say, great, love those photos. We want something similar. Um, so on that vein, maybe, I mean, which I guess is what we're all trying to do, but just putting out good stuff, like how, how can each of us show what we do better Again, that, <laughs> that, 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 that's because if, if we did that consistently we would get it coming back in so maybe it's testimonials um i guess it's all the things we always talk about but it's maybe a reminder of that that actually that really works doesn't i it? think i think con that i mean that that's the whole subject of content as well and, and it's yeah. And I think Marcus is absolutely right. If you don't need to be reaching out to strangers because you've got enough people coming to you, then that's marvellous, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Um, Holy grail. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. We can get to that stage. Okay, great. Have a really great week. And uh, looking forward to meeting up in Bristol. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, Who's coming? Forward to, uh... Quick show of hands. Who's coming? How many people? I'm going to buy an Anne-Marie It's, house. Oh, it's right. a full house. I'll, in that case, I'll book up the um, uh, I'll book up the mud dock and say there's about a dozen people coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. that'd be a good thing. That'd be a good thing. Fifteen people. Okay, that's good, Marcus. I, I, I'll actually um, I'll make I'll do a newsletter and uh, see if I can get people to respond. People that have left the call or whatever. All right, great Thanks. stuff. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Bye. week, guys. Have a good Bye. Day. Have a good week.